This video is about the Baroque style in France. This will be our last video about the Baroque style. We'll move on to Rococo and Neoclassical next. Uh, so starting off, France is an absolute monarchy. A lot of the power is consolidated with the single ruler of the French king. France becomes the dominant artistic force in Europe and in Western culture at this time, replacing Italy. So as we move on, we'll see most of the important artistic styles really beginning and flourishing in France rather than Italy. Although Italy will remain an important place where artists will want to visit and to see the old masters and to see the high renaissance uh, works of art like the Sistine Chapel. France develops a strict artistic training system with their art academy and that's where those different categories come in. Things like history painting, portrait painting, still life, um, genre painting, things of that nature. A uh, dominant painter of the 17th century in France is Poussin, and he tends to favor a strict uh, application of form and line, uh, really, really defined edges, and, and his work is dominated by this idea of form and line, very different than Rubens, which tends to have color and dynamic energy. So you have two different groups that arise, those that favor Poussin style, known as the Poussinis, and Rubens, those that favor Rubens style, the Rubenis. so two different schools of thought at this time. Uh, Louis XIV is the most important patron at the end of the 17th century in France. He has a very, very long reign, one of the longest in history, and one of his most important Commissions will be Versailles, so we'll be looking at that in just a second. Uh, just for some background, there are of course a number of wars going on. Wars continue to be a problem in the late 16th and into the 17th century, mostly due to tensions between Catholics and Protestants, and also to tensions between uh, rulers in Europe at this time. Our first French painter we'll focus on is Georges de la Tour. He is a painter that has kind of fallen in and out of favor in in those that study, for those that study art. Um, he was the ordinary painter to the king for a short time. He clearly was deeply influenced by Caravaggio. Uh, Caravaggio did a, did a series of paintings where he was interested in those being cheated on the streets or in taverns, and often you have a figure that represents the dupe or the, the person who's going to have their money taken from them. So what you see here is probably a courtesan, a woman offering her drink, uh, a man or kind of a scoundrel who's taking advantage of this clearly very wealthy young man here, a young boy. Um, he has the most money in front of him. And what seems to be happening is uh, he it has the cards behind him. She's letting him know which cards she needs, um, but she's kind of doing it in the way that she's saying, oh, I'm just asking for a drink, or she's just being held you know, given her drink. So what's fun is that we're all in on it, we know what's going on, we can see him retrieving the cards behind his back, um, but of course this young man who's made to look so over the top with his fr frilly sleeves and his ribbons and his ostrich feather, um, clearly he doesn't know what's going on. So it's it's a funny painting, um, but also speaks to some of the realities of like gamings and taverns and, and definitely speaks to the influence of Caravaggio style coming into Italy at the, or coming into France at this time. George de la Tour also did a series of penitent Magdalens. So here we see an image of the Magdalene kind of contemplating her previous uh, sinful life. So this legend of the, of the Magdalene as this sinful prostitute develops. And so we see Magda the Magdalene looking at a very luxurious mirror. A mirror at this time is very expensive, so it speaks to ideas of vanity and wealth. She's kind of gazing into it as a reminder of her previous life, but she's holding on to a skull, which is a reminder of mortality, desire for salvation. And the light, of course, can symbolize the divine. Um, it can symbolize the light of Christianity being shown on to her. Um, but it's a very quiet, contemplative image that it would allow you to pray and would allow you to reflect. And Georges de la Tour is really showing his ability with light, and he tends to cover up uh, the light source. So we can, we can just see the top of the flicker of the flame, but it's mostly covered up, um, allowing those light effects to really show off in that deep, shadowy effect, similar to Caravaggio's tenebrism. Uh, so here's our first example by Poussin. So clearly Poussin is a history painter. He's dealing primarily with grand narratives from ancient Greece, ancient Rome, so, and also the Old Testament stories that you can draw important morals from, and also stories that are somewhat unusual, which is, makes them kind of fun. Um, so what we see here is a story of the burial of Phocion, and he set it in a grand landscape with the intention that this is ancient Greece. And the story goes that Phocion was accused of being a traitor. He was executed, and then only after he was executed did they realize, did the mob realize that they'd made a mistake. And so the story here is really to indicate the dangers of a mob mentality, the dangers of 
kind of being swept up in the moment. Um, so you have here a good man who was Phocion, whose body is being carried out very sadly out of the city. Um, Poussin had never been to Greece, this is not what Greece looks like, so clearly it's kind of a composite scene of Italy and France um, and some temple fronts as he might imagine ancient Greece, um, but it's very much invented. And we clearly can see the importance of the, of the landscape coming into play, but here as an important painter he's painting a historical scene into it. <clears throat> Um, Poussin also represented a scene called the Madonna of the Stairs. This works in, in the U.S. It's the National Gallery in Washington. And the Virgin was often associated with a stairway to heaven, this idea that she was someone who would help you gain salvation. Clearly from the last two paintings you've seen, Poussin is clearly dealing in Baroque classicism. He's really interested in classical architecture. He's interested in classical subject matter. And so here he's taken the, the Holy Family and he's placed them in that kind of setting. And so we see here the Virgin Mary um, with her traditional blue and red garb. She's holding on to the Christ child. We see John the Baptist, St. Elizabeth here looking older. And then Joseph, who is deeply in shadow. So some people associate him with the Old Testament, this idea that they're moving beyond the Old Testament. Um, some people see him you know, as not the, the father of Christ, as, as less important, so he's kind of tucked over there into shadow. Um, so an interesting piece and clearly shows those crisp edges, the importance of form and drawing with Poussin. Another example of a grand kind of moral story uh, is the Judgment of Solomon, a very famous artwork, a very famous painting and a very famous story. What we have here are two women, one here and one here, both of whom have recently had a child, uh, but one of the child, one of the children has died. So you see the woman holding on to this kind of green child. Um, and clearly this is kind of the evil woman. She has kind of this greenish, greenish complexion. Uh, and the story goes that both of them had claimed this child, the living child, to be their own. That they both said, oh no, the dead child is yours, the living child is mine. So they go to Solomon to figure out what to do. It's again, set in a very classical type setting, <clears throat> elaborate columns, um, some color that's reminiscent of Baroque interiors, a relief sculpture down at the bottom. And you see here this moment where uh, Solomon has said, okay, well you both think this child is your own, well we're going to cut it in half. And so you have this man who's holding the baby by his foot and is about to slice the child in half. And the woman here, who is the true mother, says, oh no, 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 stop, I would rather she have the child than the child to die. And so clearly this woman is the true mother. Solomon gives the child to her, uh, whereas the other woman says, yeah, cut him in half, no problem. Uh, and what's great is that Poussin has incorporated a lot of emotion, a lot of drama into the postures, into the, into the gestures. So a lot of people think of Baroque painting as heavily derived from theater, the importance of gesture communicating emotion. So we see a figure here who looks horrified, a figure here, you know, the, the kind of evil mother who's like, yeah, cut him in half. And then the figure here that's going, oh, no, 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 stop. And then through Solomon's gestures, we clearly can see that she is the one who's going to be selected. She's the one who's going to be the true mother. So very interesting in that sense. And we'll see the importance of gesture carried on with uh, David when we get to neoclassical style. Another work by Poussin, one of his most famous, is called Et in Arcadio Ego, uh, Even I in Arcadia, or I too lived in Arcadia, those are two uh, possible translations. But the idea here is probably a memento mori. Again, it's set in a grand landscape similar to the burial of Phocion, and we see three men, three shepherds, who seem to be just coming across uh, a tomb. And, and the idea here is that it is reminding them that that this person has died, this person has passed away, um, and it's reminding them of their own mortality. So they're kind of running their finger across the inscription. And you see a woman here who looks like almost like a Grecian or a Greek sculpture. She has this elaborate drapery, this headscarf. Um, she has very idealized skin, very perfect, perfect skin. And the idea here is that she's kind of comforting them in this moment where they've realized what's going on, uh, where they're all kind of at different stages of contemplating it, and this woman or this goddess uh, is comforting this one shepherd on the back. So functioning similar to, for example, Masaccio's Holy Trinity, where you have that skeleton at the bottom as a reminder of mortality, um, the same idea is apparent here, but set in a very classicizing type of setting, 
very classical type of representation, um, clearly building on some of the traditions are clearly creating a, a kind of Baroque style. Um, for Poussin, uh, Raphael was especially important, so we see a lot of the same types of colors, same sweet faces, same a um, lot of similarities stylistically, and in the representation of the human body, and in color palette. Uh, the main competition probably for Poussin was Claude Lorraine, who also enjoyed setting these narratives into grand landscapes. What we see here is uh, the voyage or uh, the embarkation of the Queen of Sheba, who's voyaging to go see the king, to going to see King Solomon in Israel. And there's some possible symbolism associated with this that Solomon prefigures Christ and the Queen of Sheba represents the soul and that these two are being united as she's going off into the sun. Um, and, and really Claude Lorraine is most impressive in his representation of the sun here, this idea that the sun is just rising, um, you have the Queen of Sheba getting onto this boat and she'll be brought out to her ship and then they will go off to, to Israel to see King Solomon. And the, the light effects here are quite extraordinary and could be read as having possible divine implications. <clears throat> Okay, so the remainder of the lecture will focus on uh, Louis XIV and his palace at Versailles. So here we'll look at a portrait by Rigaud uh, towards the end of his reign. He started when he was only four years old in 1643. So by this point, he'd really consolidated power and become really a master at um, self-presentation and who he was trying to impress, uh, the nobles, the like high-status individuals in his country, those from foreign courts. And then he also wanted to be remembered, of course. So... We see Louis here with his legs on full display. People often associate this with the fact that he found this to be an attractive part of his body, that he also uh, performed in ballet performances earlier in his life. And so we see here that he still looks youthful and strong, even as he's reaching the end of his reign. Um, and there's a lot of visual effects to make him look bigger and grander. So uh, you have the legs on display, but then you also have this grand cloak kind of pouring down these stairs. Uh, you can see that it's very expensive. You have ermine fur and that in the interior you have kind of a velvety uh, satin or velvet on the outside. And then you have his crown, you have his throne, you have a dramatic cloth being pulled back. You can see that he's in some type of grand hall. Uh, it was very common at this time to have little drapes along the corners of portraits. But clearly he's a, he's a large figure, he's pointing out his power by wearing his sword, but clearly this is a more ornamental sword, it's encrusted with gems, speaking to his wealth. So he's overwhelming us with grandeur, luxury, size, uh, expense, so all of this is, is playing into the visual richness that would be part of the art of Louis XIV. So Louis XIV took a hunting lodge Versailles, just outside of Paris, and transformed it into this massive palace, which we see here. Um, it was expanded in, and added on to by later rulers Louis XV and Louis XVI. Um, it had grand gardens and additional structures built out in the gardens, and so this is all modern here and here. And uh, what we see here are some of the gardens. There were facades that were created in the Baroque style where because it is so large, you kind of have to punctuate the facades with different columns and what kind of seem like temple fronts in different areas. You have to make it go in and out so that it doesn't become too boring and flat. Um, adding sculptures to the top similar to the Piazza of St. Peter's um, where you kind of have those sculptures punctuating the different columns. The gardens themselves demonstrate the idea of nature under control in certain areas, man-made canals and, and bushes that have been sculpted and, and hedges that have been sculpted to great perfection. Uh, as we zoom in on the facade, this is where you would have seen the Hall of Mirrors. But first of all, let's look at Louis's bedroom. So Louis associated himself or he was like to think of himself as the Sun King, at the center of things. His bedroom was right at the center of the palace, and this would be a place where he was constantly on display. But you can see the rich reds and golds playing into this idea, um, and the idea that all of Versailles was really a performance. Um, part of this performance was also the Hall of Mirrors, where gatherings could be held and receptions could be held, um, where they could impress foreign visitors. Uh, so of course there are a number of mirrors here which were extremely expensive. Chandeliers, there would have been gold and silver furnishing that, that didn't survive the revolution unfortunately. Um, 
So what we see here is a space that's really supposed to overwhelm you in size. The mirrors make it seem even wider than it actually is. Uh, the different colored stones and woods and, and paintings all play into the visual richness that's very common in the dynamic or ecstatic Baroque style. Uh, and Versailles was a place where all the nobles were expected to be. This was a place where Louis could keep an eye on them. So it was a grand space, but probably not as, as beautiful or as easy as we would imagine it, um, but definitely gives us a sense of the Baroque style in France.